this is where we are in the Amida Sutra. The, uh, the Buddha said to Sariputra, uh, the name, the reason for the name of the Buddha, but, uh, and also that um, encouraging all sentient beings to vow for migration to Sukhavati. And the benefits of migrating to uh, Sukhavati is that all those who are reborn in Sukhavati will be none retroprogressed from the supreme and perfect enlightenment, meaning not falling back. Once you're there, there is no danger whatsoever in sliding back uh, from that goal of achieving perfect enlightenment. So that's what I want to share with you today is um, the concept of not falling back, the concept of irreversibility. Uh, from a perspective of Hinayana and Mahayana, Xiao Cheng and Da Cheng, Tiu Tu Va Dai Tu. And how one can, uh, what can one do to achieve that state of no, uh, no regression? Now, there's different interpretations, so we want to understand both sides. So, so this way, it also helps us by learning this today, that it helps us to gauge our own progress, where we are, where we have, um, how much progress we have made along that scale of the irreversibility. Um, when uh, the para, Paravana uh, doctrine, uh, which is Paravana, is the final uh, nirvana. Now, those uh, either Buddhas or an Arhats who uh, at, the, uh, at the end of their lives, they enter nirvana, that's called Paravana. And there are certain groups who may have misinterpreted the meaning of um, the original teachings of um, the Arhant ideal. Right, or Alohand, Alahan. And they misinterpret it into pseudo spiritual, you know, Hinayana individualism, meaning that their uh, the attainment of Nirvana has become an individual goal for oneself. What goes against the misinterpretation of the original teaching? is what becomes known as Mahayana. Right? Mahayana objects the interpretation of uh, individual emancipation, individual spiritual liberation. Hi uh, Hanayana has reduced the goal of spiritual life to mere individual enlightenment. So this kind of thinking, actually, you think about it, contradicts the career of the Buddha. And even you look, uh, you look at the, hist uh, the historical perspective, not just an ideal kind of uh, thinking, but you look at the historical life of the Buddha, you know that it is not true. That it is not just an individual uh, in enlightenment. The Buddha did not gain enlightenment for himself. But after he had gained enlightenment, he went out throughout India to preach the Dharma. So we know that by interpreting uh, that there is a, an individual enlightenment as a goal, it's wrong, right? So the goal of the Buddha's own career has been supreme enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. And we know that from history, and we know that from the scriptures recorded. So to accommodate both ideas, they came out with uh, three yanas, three ways. Uh, there's an individual enlightenment, and then there's a universal uh, enlightenment. Um, and the individual enlightenment, enlightenment has two components. One is for the Arhat, Alohan, and the other one is called private Buddha, PT4, Bhichifa. Um, and the difference is that the Arhats, the Arhats gained enlightenment from understanding the Four Noble Truths, learning from hearers, right? Shangwen hearer of the Dharma, and Pichifo, or Bichifo, or private Buddha, they gain enlightenment from observing the 12 affinities. So one is for the vast majority, which is Mahayana, and the other one is for very, very few. So 
what Mahayana is protesting was based on historical um, perspective of the Buddha's career. Right? He helped everybody throughout India, not just himself after he had gained enlightenment. And the Buddha also had taken the Bodhisattva vow for, uh, for the sake of all sentient beings. And Mahayanas declare that in reality, no sentient beings exist. So even though they're searching, they're helping sentient beings, but there are no sentient beings that exist to be helped. So the original teachings um, also believed that in delivering himself, that there's no self to be delivered. So this is the original teaching, which is correct, that they see no self. And Mahayanas also see no self as well. But the misinterpretation of certain people that they think that achieving enlightenment for oneself could be justified, you could say that it was a, um, uh, a misinterpretation because if there is no self, then there is no individuality. So we're not saying that the original teaching is wrong. It is um, valid. It's just that some people misinterpret it. Um, and that's why, and that's the protest of Mahayana is that there are certain people who misinterpreted that teaching. As on the same, uh, same line, Mahayana is you know, encouraging uh, Bodhisattvas to save others, but he is reminded that there are no others to be saved. Right? So the purpose of both teachings uh, is to make sure that the practice of dharmas function not as a hindrance, but, to, but a help to at, uh, attainment. Um, so this means that simultaneously observing the absolute truth and the relative truth. So the complete spiritual freedom of, is to be liberated from all suffering in the cycle of life and death. And the only way to achieve that is to uh, the attainment of no self. So you can see that as long as the teaching is of no self, then, then that is the proper way. And if there's no self, there is no individual emancipation, right? No individual uh, achievement. So as far as the goal of the spiritual life is concerned, the difference between the two um, Mahayana and the original teaching lies in the opposite points of departure, right? And this no self concept is important. It is, and it is fundamental to Buddhism, is because if we practice Buddhism and we have forgotten about this no self concept, and we achieve something, then achieve this arhat ideal, right? This alohan, alohan then it will degenerate into spiritual individualism because there's still a self in that practice. And if we surpass that and we practice the bodhisattva ideal, then in helping people, if there is still a, any thought of self in there, then it will just disintegrate into mere profane humanitarianism sentiment. So it's just good conduct. And so that's the difference between Buddhism and the worldly kindness, is that there is no self in it. I, the, uh, the word, those humanitarian uh, organizations also do good deeds. And Buddhism also performs skillful deeds. And the main difference is that there is no self in that, you know, performance of the deeds, of the good deeds. If we are departed um, from the doctrine, from Buddhism, in other words, more specifically, if we are departed from the law of conditionality, yuan qi fa, and wu wo, right? Well, no self, bo ngā. If we are departed from the teachings, then we are, we are, we know our practice is empty from a transcendental perspective because it does not um, align itself in the correct orientation. And what happens is that it just collapses into a mere conventional religiosity. 
which strengthens rather than weakens one's attachment to the illusion of the self and others. Right? So this no self is very important because that's what differentiates Buddhism from others. And that's what allows us to be liberated from the cycle of life and death. So again, only, trans only trans transcending the self can there be spiritual freedom and equanimity. Right? The worldly kindness can only reduce the physical pain. But, but it cannot remove the deep mental suffering. It can only satisfy, satisfy one's physical and mental satisfactions in the current life, but it will not be able to del deliver sentient beings from suffering forever. And that's why the Buddhism is different from the other teachings, is because it can deliver all sentient beings from suffering forever. So on the whole, Bodhisattva ideal is preferred to that of Arahat. I think we should uh, take a little uh, a moment here to understand uh, this a little bit clearly. Uh, the author didn't really elaborate on this, but I, I think we need to elaborate on this a little bit. It's because um, this is often the perspective of Mahayana, is to, you know, to outdo the Arahats, and that's not what it means here. If, uh, what it means is that we should not take this as a criticism of our hats. They are great achievers, and so we should not take this statement to be a criticism of our hats. But rather, it is speaking against the misunderstanding that there is some sort of a personal nirvana. And that's, what we, that's how we should understand it. Right? When we say that we are uh, practicing bodhisattva, uh, um, you know, we, we want to pursue the Bodhisattva way, Pusatao, as opposed to Alohan or Arhat. When we say that, we are reminding ourselves to reject the misunderstanding that, that there is some sort of a personal nirvana, a personal emancipation, personal freedom, okay? I think we, uh, I think we should take a moment to, to understand that so this is not some sort of criticism Buddhism, Buddha, Buddhism against Buddhism, okay? But this is to, to say that we are not accepting the misunderstanding of some sort of personal nirvana, okay? Since there's no, um, there is in reality no individuality, right? No zi wo, bang ya. Then there can be in absolute sense no such thing as individual emancipation. Right, so as long as we're talking about no self, any interpretation that there is some sort of personal nirvana is completely wrong and should be rejected. So even though we say that there is a path of the arhat and there's a path of a bodhisattva, but this does not represent an opportunity of choosing between the two real alternatives. There are no really two alternatives you can choose from. Between the two, alternatives, um, the, the path of the Arhat is just a temptation of thinking that there is a personal nirvana and that it can be uh, a personal gain, which is not proper uh, in Buddhism. Uh, for those who succumb to the temptation um, that there is some sort of individual enlightenment, then there is no further spiritual progress to be made. And I think we need to realize that if one is taking the, the, uh, the perspective that there is some sort of a personal nirvana, then you're, you're stopping yourself from making progress. In terms of Pure Land Buddhism, if we have the thinking that we hate this world, we just want to be reborn in the Sukhavati to avoid this world, to avoid the suffering, then we are taking that path we are making the same assertion that we can gain some sort of personal uh, uh, enlightenment. So if we take that perspective, individual enlightenment, then our progress will be limited. And this does not jive with the spirit of Buddhism because for individual enlightenment, there will be limited progress, there will be limited merits, virtues, and wisdom. 
And this is mis misunderstanding. And because it does not, by definition, jive with the unsurpassed supreme Buddhahood perspective. Right? How can you have unsurpassed supreme Buddhahood if your uh, progress is limited, if your merits, virtues, and freedom are limited, correct? Right? So it, there cannot be a personal, individual enlightenment. But in order to accommodate all this, the, the later Mahayana texts treat Arhat, um, you know, private Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, as pertaining to the successive state of one path. So in, instead of criticizing and breaking the traditions apart, they, uh, Mahayana's, uh, Mahayana's organizes all these uh, different paths into successive stages. So the uh, pseudo-spiritual uh, individu individualism can conduct uh, us only part of the way. So it helps initially. And I think you can look at it from a practical perspective that at the beginning you don't want to associate too much if you, are, you have a weak foundation. And it makes sense because you do want to strengthen your foundation before you expand it. And that perspective should not be the end, but it's just a means to the end, and that is appropriate, that you want to strengthen yourself so that you can help others. Just like um, Mr. Chen, Hui Zhang, like the last couple of lectures mentions that if we want to help somebody, we should have the capability to help somebody fully, not just halfway, but fully. But if we want to do that, and we don't have abilities, we could hurt others. So the best way is to migrate to the Western Pure Land so that we can gain that foundation. Because what's the point in seeing somebody uh, drowning and you jump in and you yourself don't know how to uh, swim and you have no equipment with you, you're going to drown too. In fact, you may try to pull down, pull down uh, on that person to survive. So then now you're hurting that person because you want to grab onto something and you grab onto that person and drowning that person down. So that's hurting yourself and others, right? So of course the best is try to get help because you know that it doesn't help to jump into the water when you're gonna be pulling that person down. Um, um, so the best way is really to find help. And so the best way is to migrate to the Western Pure Land to, to strengthen our foundation. Um, so, and that is from the perspective that, um, from the perspective that uh, sooner or later, if we want to advance, we have to make a different choice from that personal uh, perspective. So, in other words, if you practice selflessness, um, you cannot stand other people suffering and not uh, do anything about it. From the Mahayana point of view. Attain, um, attainment of individual enlightenment is possible, but it is simply a spiritual cul-de-sac, right? It's just an end. You cannot advance anymore. Yes, you can achieve spiritual Buddhism, I mean spiritual liberation for yourself, and you can be happy, but you will not be able to make any more um, progress. So bodhisattvas represents not a doctrine, but an ideal. And one should not take the letter, but the spirit of the teaching. So Mahayana is, um, and Mahayana and Bodhisattva, uh, Bodhisattva, it's just an ideal. It's not some sort of a, a doctrine. So how do we s resolve the two, uh, you know, the two between the two, Mahayana and Hinayana? Uh, so the difference is just an attitude. And the prana, which is uh, wisdom, zhi hui, ji dui, right? Prana as the wisdom of arhat was quite a different thing from prana as the wisdom of bodhisattvas. So there is a link between uh, wisdom and compassion. The more that a person is compassionate, the more wisdom, the more accommodating. 
right? They can see more perspective. They can see more uh, from a wider perspective. The term arhat is synonymous um, from the, uh, you know, from the uh, Hinayana's perspective is essentially the term Buddha, a narrowly individualistic manner representing an ideal infinitely inferior to that of the bodhisattva. So rather than discard the Hinayana, well, which will interrupt the continuity of tradition, Mahayana resolved this problem by staggering them into a continuous series of progress. And this set of terms correspond to uh, Bhumis. So there are 10 Bhumis in Bodhisattva, 10 levels. One to six represents the Hinayana Xiao Cheng, right? The first, the six levels belong to, essentially you can um, categorize them as Hinayana, Hinayanas. And some people say that you cannot compare it to because the Hinayana and, and Bodhisattva uh, or Mahayana, they're, they're different. But I guess Mahayana tries to do that um, by, by staggering, staggering them into 10 different levels. Once you pass the six levels, then it becomes Mahayana, um, irreversibility, uh, which will carry him to Supreme Buddhahood. The Bodhisattva ideal, that the Bodhisattva path, according to Mahayana, is divided into 10 progressive stages called Bhumi. Just like uh, go mixed with um, defilements, right? There's a, a lot of contaminants in there and you try and refine it. That's why the 10 levels. So each level that you advance to, you are refining, you're removing the contaminants, defilements. And you, may, uh, you make it into something beautiful. Every time you advance to one level, you refine it to make it pure and beautiful. And, and eventually, when you have purged away all the defilements, then you will have um, dis discovered your incorruptible nature, your, uh, your purity, right? right? So the ten, mumi, uh, 10 bumis are enumerated in the uh, Mahayana works such as the Dasa Bumi Ka Sutra, Shuti Jin, right? Uh, or Bodhisattva Bumi Sastra, um, Pusati, Bodhati. Uh, pus, um, Bodhisattva Bumi is Pusati, Bodhati, and Sastra is like uh, Lun, Lun Tian. It's not Jing Tian, but Lun Tian. Sastra as opposed to Sutra, the uh, Lung Ding. So this um, series of 10 stages um, are from the perspective of the Avatamsaka Sutras, Hua Yan Jin, from that perspective. Uh, the very first level is called Joyful, where there is a production of the thought of enlightenment. You realize there's something higher and you aspire to achieve it. So, so you have this joy in your heart that there is something greater um, than what you have and that it is possible to achieve it. And you realize that um, you're not only free from the fear of evil rebirth, but that you are sure of attaining Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. And then that, at the result of that is that you are flooded in your heart with overwhelming joy. For example, for example, you encounter a, a, a suffering situation. You are in a suffering situation. And it's very difficult to endure. But then after talking to your, your friends or, you know, Tong Xiao, your friends, and then you realize that you understand more about the law of conditionality, Yuan Qi Fa, Pap Yin Ke. Once you understand a little bit more about conditionality, you realize that suffering is not permanent. Your state of suffering is not permanent and that you are not stuck in it forever. And then, but by changing the conditions of your thinking and your behavior, you can turn suffering into happiness. 
So when you realize that, there's a sense of hope, right? There's a sense of hope that you can change for the better. And so your heart is filled with joy because you realize that you do have some say in your own destiny, your own life. And it gives you a ray of hope for change. Or another example is that you, you see, let's say you, you, you're, you see yourself as human beings and you recognize bodhisattva and buddhisattva, uh, buddhas and bodhisattvas as something, as some, uh, some ones who are really great. They're sages. And so you see no connection between yourself and the sages. And as human beings, we are like down here, but then the sages, they're, they're up there. And so like there's, we can only worship them. There's no con real connection between ourselves and, uh, and bodhisattvas up there. And you have no hope to become a, a sage because, it's, um, because you don't know how to get there. You don't know how to pass to get there. And it is very unmotivating, right? And so do you see this, this connection? There is no real connection between yourself and the sages. And it's difficult to, um, to achieve sagehood because you, you think that there needs to be a, uh, you have, need to have achieved perfections of precept, meditation, and wisdom. And when you learn about Pure Land Buddhism, you realize that Sukhavati and Amitabha will provide you a way, you know, that connection to be with the sages. And you read the sutras and it says that anybody who is reborn in Sukhavati will be hand in hand interacting with bodhisattvas. Right now, the connection is very remote. We cannot be interacting with bodhisattvas. Like Guan Xin Pusa, you know, Wang Te Bote. Right? Those sages are very far away, but when we're in Sukhavati, that, that gap is removed. So in Sukhavati, bodhi, great bodhisattvas are our peers. So it gives you a sense of hope that becoming a Buddha is absolutely possible and practical. Okay, so when you realize that your heart is filled with joy that in this lifetime, we can be liberated from the cycle of life and death, right? There's no longer any fear of being drowned in the suffering of the cycle of life and death. Does it make sense? Right? So that's, that's, uh, that is one interpretation of the mindset, the, the, the state of being of the first level is that joyful, is that you become committed to pursuing that route, right? So your heart is filled with joy overwhelmingly uh, joyful. And that motivates you to practice the, um, the, to practice the first, the practice of giving. That mo motivates you to practice Buddhism. And once you have passed that level, the second level is called immaculate where um, it is attained by perfect purity of conduct, right? your actions, your deeds. You, are, you have this purity in your, need, in your deeds, and you observe carefully the ten ways or shi shan ye, tap ting yip, mui ting yip. You practice the ten virtuous conducts, and without neglecting all the other perfections, Bolomi, Balama, all the other perfections, uh, you pay special attention to the perfections of morality. So this is the second step to becoming a uh, Bodhisattva. Uh, right? the, the first step is practicing giving. And then the second step is practicing uh, morality. Fushu uh, That's the second part. The third level up is called illuminating. And at this stage, your mind shines forth unclouded by, um, by all the defilements. But, um, so your mind is very bright, very clear. And your body, that you realize that this physical body is filled with lust, hatred, and delusion. Right? The creation of this body 
um, is filled with lust, hatred, and, and delusion. And therefore, you develop this disgust, this aversion for worldly things. So from the Pure Land perspective, this is called Yen Li So Po. Right? Um, this is called your, you have this aversion for the worldly things. Yin Li Da Ba. Right? That's um, one way of saying it from the Pure Land perspective. And because, but this doesn't mean that you really, you, you hate it emotionally. It just, the, we should understand it from a spiritual perspective. We are not hating this world, but we, we discuss it in a sense that we know there's something else better. It is, more in, it is more inferior than what we know that is something better. And therefore, we have this longing uh, for supreme enlightenment. Because we know that it's much better than what the world can give. Right? And therefore, you devote yourself day and night to the study of scriptures, sutras, and the practice of meditation. So this level here is now you're more absorbed. You're practicing meditation, which is um, chanting for lo mi. Um, okay. So there is nothing wrong with this world. It says that the practitioner wants to pursue something more meaningful. And because he practices meditation, he experiences the four jhana, sutan, thing. And he realizes, um, so he says that though the text describes him as specializing in the practice of perfection of patience. So re really the third part here is patience, ren ru, nyeng nyuk. So we have giving, we have morality, and we have, the third is really patience. Right, so, bu shu bo lo mi, ci jie bo lo mi, and ren ru, um, ren ru bo lo mi, right, ci yue ba la ma, um, bo ti ba la ma, ci yue ba la ma, va nyeng nyuk ba la ma. So, patience, perfections of patience is, is the third level of in the bodhisattva practice. So, even though that at this level, according to the author, that He's specializing in the practice of perfections of patience. But it is obvious that in this bumi, this level, the bodhisattva is more concerned with the perfections of meditation. And so why is there a discrepancy? He said that the discrepancy, because there is a, a kind of blurred line between, um, between be, uh, in the threefold path. Uh, he said that this discrepancy obviously is due to the lingering influence of the categories of the threefold path, right? Uh, your precepts, meditations, and wisdom. So, I mean, there's no clear divine, the dividing, dividing line uh, where each one ends and the other one uh, begins. But anyway, the, at this level, I guess you are transitioning uh, between you know, a perfection of, of patience and the perfections of meditation. The fourth level here is the blazing. The blazing means that is the burning up of the twin coverings. And the, uh, the two coverings are the defilement and ignorance. The ignorance is, is Wu Ming, woman. And the way that the Bodhisattva overcomes the two coverings is by the practice of the 37 principles conducive to enlightenment. So that's the fundamental practice of a Bodhisattva to remove the defilements and ignorance. Now, it is noteworthy um, to point out that it is only at this stage that the Bodhisattva is able to rid himself of wrong ideas. So the notion of this permanent Atman, this self. So you can see that you practice for a long time and it is so difficult to remove the notion that there is the self. Um, but only at, at, up to this point that you're able to see things clearly that there is no self. We may practice and study no self, but deep down in our consciousness, we don't see that very clearly because we still act 
um, in a self-centered way. So concentrating on the development of the perfections of vigor, the bodhisattva in this bumi radiates energy as the sun radiates heat and light. So the per perfections of vigor, um, our effort is jing jin bo lo mi deng deng ba la So that's the next level up. And then the fifth level is called the very difficult to conquer. Um, this refers to Mara. Mara is obstructions to the uh, attainment of enlightenment. It's now hardly able to overcome him. He develops purity and equanimity, removal of wrong views and doubts, um, and the knowledge of the right and wrong path, and the practice of the principle conducive to enlightenment. In other words, one's view is no longer perturbed by the ego. So you can you notice here that there is a knowledge of right and wrong path, and this is very crucial because at this level that you understand what's wrong and right to avoid what's wrong, and what's higher than this is to um, later on that a bodhisattva will achieve the state of none accepting and none rejecting, meaning he's has gone above and beyond the wrong and right. By this means, he is able to understand not only the Four Noble Truths, but other various truths uh, as well. Um, there is the Relative Truth and the Absolute Truth. Um, and that enables him to realize emptiness of phenomena, Kong Xin, right, Kong Tan. And by through that understanding, he sees the fertility of life of worldliness. There's no point in pursuing uh, worldly pleasures, and he pities those who are in the uh, who are the slaves of lust and pride. Um, the reasons that he sees no point in pursuing the worldly because all the motives behind in the pursuit of worldly pleasure of substantiated by right, lust and pride. And at the end, all we end up is being wrapped up in dissatisfaction and suffering and frustration. Right? All the pursuit, the worldly pursuit at the end, it ends up in dissatisfaction and frustration. But even though he sees the fertility of life, he doesn't mean that he ignores life. Just like when we just talked that when he, he sees the disgust of life, doesn't mean that he hates life. But in fact, he goes beyond that by acquiring knowledge, a knowledge of all, all the arts and sciences. So in other words, before we, we say that we give up on something, we need to have at least mastered it. And he also receives from the divas various dharanis. Dharanis um, are like mantras or special teachings for his protections when preaching the, the doctrine. So he transcends the worldliness by overcoming the grasp of selfish craving, possessive, uh, possessiveness, and ignorance. And he transcends the world by acquiring knowledge of all art, arts and sciences. So with the knowledge of the, of the wrong path and the right path, he is protected by, uh, from self-destruction by avoiding lust and pride. But you don't get to this stage and then become protected, but you protect yourself and you be, arrive at this stage. So we can use this as a, a, meter, uh, a measure to see how we ha have progress. If we are still being bothered by lust and hate uh, and, and pride, then we know that we're not at this stage. If we work at it to overcome lust and pride, then we are approaching closer to this stage. So until, um, until we attain this stage, a bodhisattva can still be tempted by Mara to slide back. The sixth level is called face to face. This means that the practitioner is standing face-to-face -face with reality. 
and he re he realizes the absolute sameness in um, in all phenomena um, through signlessness, um, through detachment, and here neither accept it nor reject it, and he sees things as dreams, illusions, as the reflections of the moon in water. We should understand that in order to achieve this level, we need to have criteria to substantiate uh, our attainment. So before we claim that attaining the state neither accepted nor rejected, one needs to be able to differentiate between wrong and right. Uh, this is crucial because at that stage where you still are differentiating between wrong and right, there is still thinking. It's not spontaneous. But once you get to the, the above this level, then it's no longer, uh, you don't need to think. It's, you are spontaneous. You are skillfully spontaneous, right? It happens right without much of, uh, without thinking because it's your natural state of being. So like um, similarly, if before we can see things as delusions, as dreams, uh, this is a very high level indeed, right? We need to have mastered the knowledge, the worldly knowledge of science and uh, of science and, art, and arts. So one has to first understand the law of conditionality before seeing the world as unreal and then give up on everything. So these states of being is not just to reject anything, but it is a very sophisticated state of achievement or you have to achieve the wisdom of to differentiate between wrong and right and to understand the law of conditionality, to understand, in other words, understand how the, the world works before you, can, uh, before you can see things as delusion. And the reason is the Bodhisattva is required to see things as a delusion uh, and to, as, a, as a dream, um, as dreams, it's because to avoid attachment. I, imagine you are very successful in your practice and you achieve many great things, but if you don't see things as illusions, then you will become attached to your achievement, right? And so that's why, but before we can say things are uh, illusions, things are as illusions as streams, we need to have attained that level first. You need to accomplish those things first. We need to put in the effort to accomplish those things first before we can claim they are just mirages and delusions. They're like dreams. By understanding the law of conditionality, for example, one understands that the tree of suffering grows without there being any doer, right? You ye bao wu zuo zhe, right? Guo ni bao ma kong guo ngui dao. What this means is that um, we cannot find a doer. The doer of karma is forever changing. There is no fixed and changing self. And so the Buddha, I mean, the doer has changed. The doer, at one point when he created the deed, he had a certain, um, I had a certain five aggregates, wu yun, wu on, right there. Form, feelings, thinkings, volitions, and consciousness. Wu Yun is se, shou, xiang, xing, shi, right? Sak, tao, teng, han, tuk. So those five aggregates continue to change. And so how we are today right now, we are defined by the five aggregates, a certain appearance, certain thinking, certain ideology in our heads. But when our ideology changes, our physical body changes, we have become another person. So we cannot say it's the same person that created the karma. Does it make sense? But there is the result, there is consequence. It doesn't mean that when there is no doer, no fixed doer of the karma, doesn't mean there's no body taking responsibility. When we change to a, a new five aggregates, 五运, 
nguồn. Those will provide conditions to attract the karma to come to fruition. And because we are attached to it, we receive the, the feelings, of the suffering or the happiness, whatever the karma that we created. So we create the conditions to attract the, um, the, the fruition of the karma. Does it make sense? And therefore, even though there's no doer, there's result. That's why we have the suffering, because it is a process. We have new five aggregates, and we're providing a few, uh, the conditions, the land, the soil, for the seed to grow. Right? It's, it, we are providing the conditions for the past karma to, go, to grow. And because there is attachment, there is a self that we are attached to it. And so as part of that, that we receive it, and we uh, attach to it, and therefore, it comes with the, the feelings that we encounter suffering or happiness. Um, at this level, the Bodhisattva apprehends reality through three perspectives. One is signlessness, wu xiang, vo tu. The other one is wishlessness, and the other one is emptiness. Signlessness here, we explained this in a prior um, uh, discussions, but briefly, signlessness here is mean that there is no, the understanding that there is no fixed, unchanging form, and that the Bodhisattva, bodhisattva is no longer fooled by the percep by perception through the senses. Signlessness is when you see something, you are not deceived. You don't become emotional. So you're not being fooled by your, your eyes, your ears, your, you know, your nose, your hearing, your those senses. So that's when you are no longer being fooled by the signs. Then you are, you don't have delusion. Right. So when you are not being fooled by your perceptions through your senses, then you have no delusion. And therefore, you are no longer being wrapped up in that delusion. And you are so-called liberated from that delusion. The second is wishlessness, where there is no egoistic pursuit to satisfy our selfish craving. Right, um, there, there's, there's no wish, yuan, right? There's no wish to pursue something because you are, if you are liberated, you are, in a sense, self-contained. You are satisfied. Therefore, there is no point in pursuing something because there is no selfishness, so no selfish craving to want to pursue something. And therefore, there's no wishing for something. And... And because you don't wish for something, you don't chase after it. Because when you chase after something, you are reinforcing in your mind that you lack something. So you create a condition to make yourself think that you lack something. Therefore, you have to pursue it. So when you lack something, you are not satisfied. When you lack something, you are not free. And when you have this selfish craving, you are not free. Because once you acquire it, it does not satisfy you. You acquire something not because you want it, but because you want to experience what you think will give you happiness. And when you realize that, it's that when you acquire it, it, it is no longer the same as what you had before, and therefore it does not meet your expectation, and therefore it, it leads to dissatisfaction. Just like we talked about yesterday, like money. Money is useless. You cannot eat money. You cannot, if you're sick, money cannot heal you. Right? If you're hungry, you cannot eat money to make you full. But what money can do is it gives you ability to exchange money for something that you want. So when we pursue money, when we spend time making money, it is that we are pursuing the feeling, the safety, right? the ability to convert money into things that we want. 
And so that's what we're pursuing. And so when you have wishlessness, you are pursuing something, but then behind that acquisition, once you have it, there is fear behind it because it's not what you want. Because once you realize that you have money, the next thing is no, it's no longer safety, but it's fear. Fear of losing. So that's why wishlessness leads to freedom, spiritual freedom, is because no, you are no longer lacking anything that needs to be filled. Does it make sense? And the third gate to enter to achieve spiritual emancipation, spiritual freedom, is called emptiness. Right here, emptiness is the understanding of conditionality. It doesn't mean that things don't exist, but you understand things change and that there is no substance in any sing anything at all that it changes. It changes based on condition. So when we pass through all three gates, the gates of uh, signlessness, wishlessness, and emptiness, it leads to spiritual freedom. So we can use this as a gauge to determine how free we are. Are we free from our perceptions? Are we free from our desire, your, our selfish craving? And are we see from you know, seeing through things uh, and seeing conditionality? In, in other words, see how things work, how the world works. Right? When you understand conditionality, when you understand emptiness, you understand how things operate. So when we <clears throat> are no longer being wrapped up by our, by our perceptions, by our selfish craving and our attachment, then we are free. Does it make sense? The first, um, and then the Bodhisattva is represented as having gained, in addition to the attributes of a Bodhisattva, all the qualities of Arahant. So this is where the two paths start to de departure. The Hinayana, Xiao Cheng, Diu stops there. And Mahayana, a Bodhisattva, Bodha, Pusa, continues to grow. Right? So the first six levels, the first six Bumis, belong to the Hinayana uh, way of thinking. And then if we want to grow, we cannot stop there. We have to continue. And that takes us to um, seventh level, eighth, nine, ten. So the seven to ten are transcending, transcending the Hanayana's perspective. So the seventh level is called far going, and it is called because commencing from this bumi, the Bodhisattva transcending the Hinayana moves in the directions of supreme enlightenment. Um, attain, attaining emancipation without entering personal nirvana, meaning no dwelling nirvana. So, wu zu, nepan, bo zhu, nikban. So the Bodhisattva's progress is no longer that of an individual. He is now an impersonal cosmic force, and his activities are part of the omnipotent uh, omnipresent transcendental activities of the Dhammakaya. Dhamma, this is the Dhamma uh, body, Fa Shen, right? Fa And this far going because he is moving beyond the personal um, attainment. He's moving beyond that. And at this level that, um, that he, will, he becomes the cosmic force of all phenomena. And it is said here that if we perceive him functioning as an individual, if, he, if we think that he's doing something that is individualistic, it is only due, to, uh, due simply to our mental defilements. It is our own defilements in our mind that make us think that he's being individualistic uh, because he's using skillful means, right? Shan xiao fang bian, ting sao fu ting. He's using skillful means to help others. And when we don't understand that skillful means, it is our, our own misinterpretation. 
This is where he becomes the teachers of the three thousand worlds: San Qian, Da Qian, Shi Jie, right? Dam Ting, Lao Ting, Tai Yue. And in accordance with his great vow, he appears in the various planes of mundane existence, all throughout the universe, to become a teachers of men and heavens. To become teachers and to help and deliver all sentient beings. So that's seven. Uh, where he's now, having moved beyond the individual focus, he's now advancing to a much further point in the uh, in that progress, and therefore he is deserve he deserves to become the teachers of man and heavens, heaven beings. The next level up, eight, is called immovable. Immovable here is, is undisturbed. He is undisturbed by the twin concepts of causations and non-causations. And he develops kasanti. Kasanti is called forbearance. Or some interpretations render this as wisdom and not just a mere endurance, but is wisdom. For example, we have this called the acqu uh, acquiescence in the or unoriginatedness of phenomena, which is a very <clears throat> strange way of, of naming this, but in Chinese and even Vietnamese, it sounds very beautiful. Wu shan fa ren, right? Wu shan fa nian. So the, the wu shan means unoriginatedness, and fa ren, a fa nian, here is, is not just to endure, but it's wisdom. So we should understand uh, Kasanti to be wisdom and not just mere endurance. The Buddhas, by reminding him of his great vow once and for all, prevent him from relapsing into personal nirvana. So at this stage, you really notice that he refer, uh, the author refers to a bodhisattva at this stage as a Buddha. So at this stage, the, bo the Bodhisattva has become a Buddha uh, because he is now in possession of all the qualities of a Buddha. And, that, and he, so at this level that he is equivalent to a Buddha. Um, and in, co in consequence of which he, in which the possibility of retrogressions is permanently precluded. We no longer falling back. Um, so there, there are different levels of non-regression. You have the, for example, the behavioral non-regression where there is no longer any kind of danger of sliding back in the evil realm because you have so much, mo so much momentum in your skillfulness that you don't fall back. You're no longer falling back. Um, you are completely skillful. And then there's another level called you know, mind non-regressions where the bodhisattva is no longer in any kind of danger of falling back um, to personal freedom because he has so much compassion, so much momentum that he will never slide back. So important is this bumi, this level, uh, in which the perfection of vows receives the greatest attention. So that's a lot of discussions of the eighth level, right, unmovable. Because this, at this level that he um, is in possession of all the qualities of the Buddhas. Um, that is termed the stage of perfection, birth and finality. And then after that is the ninth level, the ninth bumi, it's called good thoughts. And this is called because the Bodhisattva possesses good thoughts on account of analytical knowledge. So we see that there are different levels of knowledge, wisdom. But this knowledge here um, allows him to truly uh, differentiate, understands all the characteristics of, uh, of all dhammas. He knows the duties. He knows the duties of the hearers. 
of the private Buddhas, of Bodhisattvas and Buddhas, and he knows thoroughly all the thoughts and desires of men. After he has, accom uh, has accomplished this, then the next last level, according to um, the Bhumis, it's called the tenth level, and it's the cloud of doctrine. And at this stage, that he becomes truly a Buddha. So we talked about the Ranis just a little a while ago back. The Ranis you can call as mantras. The Ranis are mantras. Um, the Rani is often translated as mantra, but it's also but it is also translated uh, as summary or like a handle of things. For example, if you you have shirts, you have you, you have the sleeves, you have the collars, you, you have the um, the hems, different parts. But if you want to pick up the shirt, you just need to grab on the collar and you grab hold of the sleeve. In other words, when you understand the Dharanis, you understand everything about it. It's just the understand the gist about it, the summary, if you will, of how it is or what it is. Right. At this level, as a result of these sam uh, samadhis, which is chanting, right? San Moti, Tamadi, there appears a significant jewel adorned lotus of infinite size and radiance on which the Bodhisattva sits. So at this level, he, he sits in a very glorious uh, lotus flower and surrounded him by countless Bodhisattvas belonging to the nine stages. So all the bodhisattvas uh, below uh, um, flank him, uh, surround him to learn from him. And at this point that he is being pronounced, consecrated as the Tathagatas, Wu Lai, Nyu Lai. So he is now being pronounced, recognized by all the bodhisattvas below him as the leader, as truly Buddha. So now, this, uh, now he is a Buddha, and he has reached the endless end of his career. So is this the end? Of course not. He is, this is not the end for him, because he will continue to work for the emancipation of all sentient beings. So the work, in a sense, has just begun. When we achieve a, a Buddhahood, it doesn't mean it's the end, but it's the beginning of another beautiful chapter. Now we have all sorts of abilities to help even more sentient beings. So having achieved this ultimate, he does not stop and rest on his laurel, but he continues to work to help all sentient beings to achieve, the, uh, to achieve liberal, spiritual liberation. So... The bodhisattvas at this stage are Maitreya, Mila, Pusa, Yilak, Bhota, who is, according to the script scriptures, currently are in the, the Sita heaven, right? Or the uh, Avalokasvara, um, Guanxin Pusa, Wangtan Bhota, or Manjuri, Manjuri um, Bodhisattva, Wangtu um, Shula Bhota. So those are the 10, we've just talked about it, the differentiation between the, um, you know, the Hinayana perspective and the um, Mahayana Bodhisattva perspective that the Hinayanas, they practice and they achieve up to six levels. If you want to tie the two school together, one is Hinayana and the other one is Mahayana, if you want to see where they line up, then you can use this scale of 10 Bhumis to see where they line up. Right? The first six belong to Hinayana, and then seven, eight, nine, ten 10 belong to a Bodhisattva, which is Mahayana. Important point thing here that we want to talk about is called the non-regression. We want to see at what point do they become um, irreversible. We want to know at what point that one side is consider, uh, considers as non-regression and the other side considers as non-regression. So we, we have a few more minutes left and let's um, talk about the differences between um, Hinayana perspective and Mahayana. 
from Mahayana Hinayana perspective, Xiao Cheng, Xiao Cheng, and due to, uh, due to, it's called stream entry. And for Mahayana about Bodhisattva, it's called non-regression Bodhisattva. So at that point, is that they are no longer in any kind of danger to slide back, right? Um, stream entry is formulated by the early Buddhist schools. Um, so that's stream entry. To them, stream entry is like you have seven more births, and then you become uh, liberated from the cycle of life and death. So then for Hinayana, it is absolutely important to reach that level, stream entry level, because at that level is when you are secure from ever sliding back. You won't ever slide back to a lower realms. You won't face you know, the evil realms anymore. You may come back as, human, as a human being, but you are no longer in the danger of being stuck in the three uh, evil realms, right? realms of hell, hungry ghost, and animal. You may be born as a human being, you may be born as a, a heaven being, but you do not forget your goal because you have so much momentum that you will never forget your goal and you will continue to advance. So from the Hinayana perspective, it is absolutely important to achieve this uh, stream entry level. For the bodies, uh, for the uh, Mahayana, they, the focus is on uh, irreversibility, to achieve that level so that you can slide back to a lower realm. And it's really the same thing from, from this perspective. And, we, and there are differences, so let's look at the differences. So how does one achieve this uh, stream entry? What's the formula? What are the things that a practitioner needs to do to achieve this level? So according to the Theravada teaching um, in the Ahan Ching, in the Nikaya uh, Sutra, the first thing that the practitioner needs to do to achieve that level is to overcome the, the three feathers, at least the three feathers. And the first feather is called self-view, shen jian, peng jing, to overcome self-view. So in, according to Theravada teaching, a stream entry is achieved by breaking the first three feathers, and the first one being belief in the self or self-view. Um, because it includes the conviction that there is no such thing as universal consciousness, absolute reality outside oneself. Bound by this letter, we think, bound by this feather, we think that we ourselves are the point upon which all ends of the world are come, and that our personal individual existence is irreducible and ultimate. So with, with this view, with a self-view, we see that we are at the center of the universe. And that's where the attachment continues to drown us. So by breaking this, we are floating up one level, you will. You say you, imagine you're being drowned by, um, in water when you, because you're being tied to the ground, to the, um, to the depth of the body of water. But when you remove the teaching, you are cutting one, and then you are, you are now up closer to liberation. So sometimes we see something greater than ourselves, but usually we believe in ourselves in this narrow, limited, egoistic sense as identified by, with the body and with the lower mind, the lower consciousness, the, the egoistic, the animalistic consciousness, right? The, our animalistic consciousness that we have, that we just react emotionally. That's the lower mind. The, the higher mind, the hell, higher conscious mind is when you, 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 you don't react emotionally and you don't get fooled by your perception, perception through your senses. You're know, seeing, you're your, your smelling, um, you're sensing. All those sensing, uh, you don't get fooled by, um, by your sensors. And so when you remove this self-view, you have this higher vision. 
and you are no longer being bounded by this, um, by this egoistic drive. And this has to be broken before we can enter uh, the stream. And so this self view has to be broken first. Uh, there are different ways of looking at insight experiences, but the Theravada conceptions of breaking the fetters provides us with the standards by which to measure our progress. So this is a very good way of measuring how much we have progressed. Um, how much do, how much important, how much importance do we put on this self, this body, right? This, this self view, how important do we see ourselves? If we see ourselves being very important, then we are not close to you know, admit, uh, this level at all, this irreversibility, this stream entrance. We're no longer close, we're not any closer to the stream. So we, if, we if we continue to see in terms of me, myself, and I, then clearly we haven't de developed much in the way of insight, meaning wisdom. We don't have much wisdom if we continue to see things from our self-perspective. So as insight develops, we make a transition from the conditioned to the unconditioned, loosening the ties or fetters that bind us to the conditioned. Right? And to this cycle of life and death, to suffering, to, pe to uh, fear and dissatisfaction. The second fetter to break is called doubt. <clears throat> Not in the sense of objective, cool, critical inquiry, but a soul co corroding an ease that won't settle down in anything. That is full of fears, humors, and whimsicalities that won't be satisfied that doesn't want to know and shies away from knowing, that won't try to find out, and then complains that it is uh, that it doesn't know. So this this doubt is when you read sutras and you have doubts, uh, it's not what is what's being talked here. This doubt when you have um, critical thinking that you want to find out about something, that is healthy doubt because it helps to clear the mind. But this doubt here is that you're not willing to make commitment. And, you, and some people feel very comfort, comfortable living with doubt. Why? Well, because in this way, they have an excuse not to ever make a decision, not to make a commitment. They don't want to have a commitment. So therefore, by having doubt, they have that reservation. They say, I don't need to make a commitment because I still have doubt. So this doubt here does not allow you to advance, but it prohibits you from making progress. And therefore, you can not get close to the stream. Right? The third feather is called dependence on moral religious rules as ends in themselves. The third feather here is dependence on moral rules and religious observances. Um, he says, if we are too moral, we cannot become enlightened. <laughs> Which is not to say, of course, that, we, that if we are immoral, uh, we gain enlightenment more easily. But if we think a lot about ourselves on account of our being good, holy, and pure, um, then, then we are nowhere uh, in comparison. Um, when then we're nowhere near the stream. Um, so the, the practice becomes mechanical and meaningless. That you come to the Dharma assembly, you're very diligent, but it becomes mechanical because you don't, don't understand the meaning of attending a, a Dharma assembly. So you're just going through the motion without understanding the meanings. Of course, this is not to say that moral rules and religious um, observances are bad, but they should be means to an end, not an end in, uh, in itself. Right? They, they should not be ends in themselves. So, so to quickly summarize here, that um, early uh, Buddhist schools focus on eliminating the five fetters. In this case, we talked about the three fetters to achieve stream entry. 
and and each feather each feather that you break you achieve one level and when you have broken all 10 feathers then you achieve our hats alohan alohan at that level from the mahayana school's perspective a bodhisattva would have to traverse through 10 bumis to achieve complete buddhahood um, so let me wrap this up here by by focus, by saying why is non retro progression important? Why is no Bu Toi John Bak Toi Jin? Why is non regression so important? So we see that even if we observe the religious rules um, diligently, but it but it there's no guarantee that we can achieve. Um, a point of no return. So this is a good reminder that there is no safe way of practicing the Dharma. You cannot just blindly practice the Dharma and hope that you continue to advance. That's what it means here. So this is what the, the third uh, feather here is telling us that if we have too much dependence on moral and religious rules and we take them as ends in themselves, then, then we cannot... Uh, um, there's no guarantee that we will advance. So it is dangerous to practice the precepts. For example, in the sense that there is the possibility of practicing, practicing them wrongly. So, so again, even if we pr observe the rules and put in diligent effort, there is a good chance that we are practicing um, it wrong. So to ask for a completely safe practice is to ask for a practice in which attitude doesn't matter, a practice which is always sure to be right, uh, to be the right thing to do. But this is impossible. You cannot just blindly go through an emotion and expect that you arrive at a destination. Right? You just, you just, it's a crap shoot. You're just taking your chances. Where there is a possibility of skillfulness there is also a possibility of unskillfulness. So until such time as one is a stream entrant, um, there's always a danger of falling back. So that's why obtaining this non-retrogression, non-regression is so important because until you achieve that point, there is always the possibility, the danger of you sliding back, right? Um, so this is so this is not kind of set and forget, uh, but one will have to use wisdom to stay away from unskillfulness um, and to, to to not be in the grip of the of the, the feathers. And so there there because there are so many reasons to do it wrong. You can you can do it wrong by attending a puja, which is a dharma assembly, fa hui fa hui. You can attend a Dhamma, but then you can be doing it wrong. Um, because if you do it in an unskillful state of mind, then that is, and with unskillful reasons, then that's wrong. Or you can read a Buddhist book for the wrong reason, and you can adopt a wrong attitude towards one's meditation uh, practice, thinking that it, is, that it makes one better than the other people. So that's, it will increase your arrogance, Alman. So in short, it is possible to be a Buddhist for entirely the wrong reasons. Right? So until we reach the state of stream entering, a state of irreversibility, there is a possibility that we can practice Buddhism for the wrong reasons. Right? Okay, let's uh, stop here. And next time when we meet, I want to talk about going to the, the core uh, topic of why people give up. Okay. All right, let's do merit dedication. You could please join your palms together, we recite. May the merits and virtues accrue today. Adorn the Buddha pure lands. Repay four types of kindness above 
and aid those suffering in the paths below. May those who see and hear of this bring forth the resolve for the Bodhi mind. When this retribution body is complete, together we shall meet in the land of ultimate bliss. <laughs>